So why is the rule of law important, right? And what does it mean, the rule of law? Does the rule of law mean the rule of laws? So first, the rule of law is to separate from the rule of man. Right? The idea of the rule of law is that there's certain objective, knowable, predictable laws out there that one can live by that they're not dependent on the arbitrary whim of a ruler, a dictator, authoritarian, a judge, a policeman, or whoever, whoever has a gun, whoever has power. So the whole idea is to subordinate society to objectivity, to objective laws, rather than to subject society to, subjugate society to the rule of human beings, the rule of people, the rule of a system. And the idea of the rule of law is that the laws are not just arbitrary, they're not just whatever, but they're guided by particular principles, that there is a reason for them, justified not in, in, in arbitrary whim, justified not in the whim of any one person or in the whim of many people, in the whim of the majority. The idea of the rule of law is that the laws are there to achieve a certain purpose, really a certain moral purpose. Law should be grounded in morality. You don't legislate morality. But laws have to be grounded in a certain view of morality. And in the case of America, in the case of a free country, those laws should be grounded on the idea that your life belongs to you. In order to live your life, you must attain property which belongs to you. And the laws are really there to protect you, your rights, your right to your life, your right to your property, your right to liberty, your right to act based on your own judgment, based on your own reason, in pursuit of the values that are necessary for your happiness. So laws are supposed to be, in the American legal system, at least the way I see it, I'm not sure many people in the legal system see it this way, laws are supposed to be grounded in the protection of individual rights. Their justification is, or should be, the protection of individual rights. Property rights, rights to liberty, right to your life. Laws are not objective when they violate those rights. When the consequence of the majority imposing itself on the minority. And we know Ayn Rand always said, the smallest minority on earth is the individual. So when the majority imposes themselves on the individual, when the majority violates the rights of the individual, that is not objective law. That is not the rule of law. That is the negation of the rule of law. So law should be grounded, must be grounded in morality. It must apply to all. We have equality before the law. All of us have rights. All of us have the right to life, liberty, property in the pursuit of happiness. And the law must apply to all of us equally, the same. It must be protecting our rights equally and the same. And finally, these laws must be knowable, predictable, objective. Objective both in the predictability and nobility, but also in the fact that they are grounded on something real, <clears throat> on the protection of rights. <clears throat> now, to some extent, uh, you know, America has always failed in this regard, or for much of its history has failed, uh, starting with slavery, Jim Crow laws, obviously were not grounded in the protection of individual rights and were not applied equally to everyone. Laws that discriminate it are laws that don't constitute the rule of law. They're anti the rule of law. They're the negation of the rule of law. Because the negation for the purpose of law, which is the protection of rights. 
And remember that this idea of the rule of law, this idea of individual rights, even when it's not fully understood, even when it's practicing consistently as it was in America, but even in places like Europe and elsewhere, where it was suddenly practiced in, in, inconsistently and to a large extent not even known, it was implicit, it wasn't explicit, there wasn't the, 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 the theory of individual rights did not motivate the legal agenda in Europe the way it did early on in the United States with a declaration and a constitution. European countries did not have that kind of constitution that was centered around this concept of individual rights, but implicit because the modern world in which we live is a world based on enlightenment ideas, based on enlightenment philosophy, based on enlightenment political theory, even when they don't know it, even among people who don't recognize that, who are not aware of it, who didn't do it consciously. The actual reality is that our system, our modern system, even a system in places like Japan or in, in parts of Asia that are, that, are, that are relatively free politically, they're based on ideas of enlightenment. They are based on ideas of individual rights, whether they know it or not. And almost all these systems have some protections for the individual against the majority. They have some protections of those rights. Not consistent, not systematic, certainly not as good as they have been at their best protected in the United States. But what dominates the free world are these Enlightenment ideas. And the Enlightenment ideas of the sanctity of the individual. And the Enlightenment political idea that the role of the state is to protect the rights of that individual. To leave him free. To pursue his own happiness. To pursue his own life. To pursue his own values. To pursue property. And to protect that pursuit from physical coercion. I mean, that is the foundational base of all countries that are today call themselves democracies. Because none of them are absolute democracies in a sense that the majority can vote on anything. All of them have some principles by which limit the power of the majority. So they're all inconsistent applications of the rule of law. They're all inconsistent applications of the idea of individual rights. But it's still the foundation for all of them. Now, what separates this modern era from previous eras? What makes, what's obvious about this era as compared to previous eras, the last 200, 250 years, is that we live in a civilized place. We live in a civilized world. We live in relative safety. We live in places where for the most part, again, with exceptions, right? We had communism and we had fascism, which were the exception. But for the most part, we live in places where you can mostly do what you want to do, say what you want to say, live your life according to your values. People don't intervene. People don't interrupt. And generally, the police are there to protect you and to put away criminals, put them in jail. And... The difference between living in such a civilized environment where the laws are predictable, you know what's going to happen, you're not at the whim of the majority or the dictator, you're not at the whim of the people in power, and the mobs don't control the streets, and the criminals don't run things, so that you can live life. Not perfectly, because we know the rule of law in the West has not been perfect. We have compromised on it forever. Vonda, thank you. That's very generous. But for the most part, we have lived in a world in which the rules were noble, objective, predictable, and applied equally before the law with some exceptions around Jim Crow laws and other things. But even that is somewhat behind us, although now we have other things like affirmative action. But imperfectly as it is, We've managed to build businesses, create wealth, own homes, live relatively safe life, safe from violence. We can walk in the streets, drive around. It's civilized. And a lot of what civilized means is this peace. 
We're not fighting in the streets. And we can protect, we don't have to arm ourselves to the teeth in order to protect our property. And we're not constantly in fear of our own government, or of gangs, or of, you know, or for the most part, of the police themselves. But that is a thin line between civilization and barbarity. It's only 300 years ago where this did not exist anywhere. I mean, there were better places and worse places. There were better kings and worse kings. But generally, it was a king, and you were susceptible to his whim and the whim of those that he controlled and the whim of those who controlled him, depending on the place and the time. And before that, it was roving gangs and, you know, little towns and the church and just barbarity everywhere and violence and, and, and a threat to everything. And there, you, you couldn't, there was no preserving and maintaining your property without being armed to the teeth. And wealth was associated with buying firepower and buying protection. That's what you use your wealth for. There's nothing much to buy with wealth in those days. The rule of law is what allows us to live a civilized life. It was, allows us to live in safety, not fear for our lives and our property constantly. So it's something to monitor. It's something to be aware of. It's something that's important to make sure we don't lose. So when you see people smashing storefronts, rioting in the streets, and the police doing nothing, there is real reason to be concerned. When you see people knocking down monuments, look, I, I am a proponent of getting rid of monuments to the Confederacy. I don't believe there should be monuments to General Lee in public spaces. I'm not big on public spaces to begin with, but if we have them, we shouldn't be celebrating the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis. These are the most anti-American people. These are people that committed treason and sedition. These are people who fought against the legitimate government of the United States of America. And these are people who did it in the name not of freedom, but in the name of slavery. In the name of maintaining other human beings as their property. And yeah, I would like to see every one of those statues toppled by the authorities, by the people who own the property, not by mobs, not by gangs, who then cannot differentiate between Thomas Jefferson and Jefferson Davis, between Lee and between George Washington. It's a mob mentality. Thinking is not strong in a mob. History is not strong in a mob. Violence, fear, anger, destruction, that is what mobs are for. And this is property. And you think it's public property, so it's no big deal. But once you abandon public property like that, then they're going to come after your property. They're going to come after private property, and they have, right? The riots smash private property, and nobody seems to care either. So I'm all for the monuments coming down, all of them. The names of the forts being changed. The fact that secession was considered okay back then, which I am very dubious of. Sounds like, uh, sounds like rewriting of history. Um, doesn't matter. These are bad people. Evil people. Evil people. Who maintained the right to secede in order to secede to maintain slavery. Secession is only valid if you're seceding to increase freedom. It's never valid if you're seceding in order to reduce freedom.
So these are the enemies of the United States of America, the enemies of the Declaration of Independence, the enemies of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the enemies of the equality of man, equality before the law, equality of rights. And finally, we got to the point in American history where we were going to apply the idea of rule of law, equality before the law, and these people objected. These people rejected the Declaration of Independence. And if you read the intellectuals of the South during this period, they were anti-American, anti-Declaration, anti-Constitution, anti-Founding Fathers. They were influenced heavily by German philosophy. They were Hegelians. They were really bad folks. So monuments to them. No, put them in a museum where you explain how evil and bad they really are. Alex, wow, that is very, very generous. Thank you. A lot of really generous contributions on Super Chat tonight. It's just terrific. Thank you all for supporting me. A good, good chance to stop and say, you know, you can support me in a variety of different ways. Super Chat is one way, very much appreciated. You can also do it uh, monthly on... Uh, Patreon or uh, subscribestar.com or uh, on my website through PayPal, youronbookshow.com slash support. And also on locals. The locals use Stripe. So you can do it Stripe, PayPal, credit card, uh, you know, and of course Super Chat. So uh, uh, thank you all. So monument should go. But there is a way to get rid of them. Petition. Demonstrate, write letters to your congressman or state senator, state congressman, get them to do their job. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.